Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Shift gears just a little bit, Mark. I'm, I have heard from one or two people that um, you know we should perhaps try to figure out different ways to to pay for these instead of user fees. You know, let's figure out how to build sewer lines without um, without paying for them as an individual. Even though I'm the one that uses it, I shouldn't have to pay for it. And so, I'm trying to wrap my head around that. And the suggestion has been, why don't we use the second penny? You know, that that item that was set aside in the late 80s, early 90s for capital projects. You know, there was an emphasis in Sioux Falls for a long time on those being street projects, but we it really the emphasis from the state level has been on capital projects in general. So really I'm trying to wrap my head around that. Okay, let's say we're gonna we're gonna stop raising user fees to to build water pipes and sewer pipes and those kinds of things. So can you give if you can just stick with me for a minute, can you give me an idea how much money this these increases will raise over the next three to five years? Do we know how much they will raise in even a year? I do. Dean, do you have that information? We'll give you the sum total, if you don't mind, with uh, 17, 18, and 19 for the for utilities. Okay, so um, we normally get this question each year about what was the additional rate revenue, and and also just um, also try to show specifically where those investments are going to go. That's why we show the modeling assumptions and also show you where the key capital investments are. Um, but if we look at water, storm drainage, light and power, and water reclamation, and we look at what the additional rate increase revenue will generate over that three years um, between 17, 18, 19, that'll be about $21 million. Um, $21 million, uh, 99000 So let's say um, that we decided to do that. We're not going to. We're not going to do this increase, and so we're going to give up the twenty-one million dollars over the next over that three-year period. Can you tell me what does that look like in your CIP? Because it's going back on you. It's going back to the Public Works. What kind of streets then are we not going to do? What kind of um, what are the things that we would have to trade out? How do we make that balance? If if we're going to take that twenty-one million dollars out of your CIP project. Well, and I'll probably um, source Tracy for this as well. He really analyzes the second penny sales tax and does your monthly update. But essentially, when you look at um, just the capital plan in um, 17, 18, and 19, and if you look at what's available, um, because we all we know that there's a portion that's been dedicated to debt, and then we have the other, which would I would say um, gets prioritized based on public works, um, parks, other departments, and equipment, um, public works already gets the majority of those dollars. That's why I'm taking it from you, the $21 million. I'm taking it from you because you have the biggest chunk of it, right? Right. So right now, if you look at public works, probably uh, of those available dollars takes about 70% of that. And our street system is, uh, it's growing. Uh, and it also, on a constant basis, is the one asset that, uh, the city, the city uses, and but it's one of those key things that we've learned that you can't stop investing in it, and so you know it would it would obviously greatly affect our maintenance program, our reconstruction program, uh, our entire program. Uh, maybe Tracy can also share some other specifics, but uh, it would have a substantial effect on the capital plan for public works. Okay. My other question then, Tracy, would because you know this is my favorite, um, what if we took it out of parks? $21 million over three years. I think the parks budget in some years is, is it's in the seven, eight million dollar range. So we can just do away with the parks for three years in a row and we've got it covered, right? Yeah, looking at, at the uh, following through with, with the thought that Mark started and looking at those three years for 17, 18, and 19 and trying to recapture that $21 million uh, number over that three year time period. Um, the, the parks, the current plan in place for parks, uh, the, the, the equipment that we purchase out of the second penny revenue for parks and the park projects, the improvements uh, amounts to $24 million. So you could essentially um, take all that 21 million out of the parks plan and you'd have enough left to buy them some of their mowers, and but that would be about it. There would be no other, I mean, no other funds remaining. If you wanted to leave highways and streets part of the plan untouched. Okay, I just, 
I ask these questions to be, to be realistic about this because this is a government that we've got all kinds of things that, that are our priorities. We, I mean, I drive down Minnesota Avenue and I, I thank God for Mark Cotter every day now because my curb and gutter is getting rebuilt, right? That's been one of my big concerns. Our streets are in tough shape. So we have to figure out as the leaders of this community that this all has to balance somehow. And this is one way that we have to do it. Yeah, it stinks to have to raise water rates. I'm sorry, but this is, this is part of how we make it balanced. So I would just encourage the team, you know, we've got the first reading tonight and the second reading isn't for a while, but I'd encourage us all to look at this very carefully and think about that $21 million. Where else would you find it? I'm open. Where else are you gonna find $21 million to make sure we have safe water? I mean, the word lead is in the report there. We're trying to get rid of lead. Let's talk about Flint, Michigan and, and you know have that conversation too. I'm just really concerned that we have to be leaders in this conversation and we have to make this stuff balance. Thanks. Councilor Rolfing. Yes, thank you. I would reiterate what uh, Councilman or Councilperson uh, Urbanbach just said. But um, I have a couple other uh, questions. Um, Mark, I'm sure. How long is, uh, when did we start raising rates? Because I know for a number of years we did nothing. Can you give me the dates on that? Right, so we really started a concerted effort in 2006 um, because there was a number of years prior that were either uh, zero or nominal rates. And so we have been in um, I'd say a catch-up mode with rate uh, reviews since 06. You did see tonight that we've, with light, with water, we just came off two years without any rate increase. And so it took us a few years to get to that healthy mark to a point where we could appropriately fund the operation but also be investing in our capital system. Uh, you've seen tonight that um, a landfill does not have a rate increase. Uh, you've seen the last rate review, light and power didn't have a rate increase. So we are getting to that point with probably the exception of wastewater that we are at that uh, zero to inflationary rate increase. But uh, prior to, uh, I did look back today and uh, just for perspective from 94 to 2003, there's no rate increase in water. So that was, uh, so from 1994 to 2003, there was no increase in the water rates. Years. Yep. And then a little different picture in sanitary sewer. So between 1989 and 94, there was one rate increase of 4%. In, from 94 to 2001, there was a 5% rate increase. And then really nothing appreciable until we got to 2006. So that gives you a picture from 89 to essentially 2005 that you had a 4% rate increase and a 5% rate increase. And there's a lot of investment that needs to be made. And I would just stay there because I have a couple other questions, but I, one of the, the things with the SUI the wastewater uh, plant. I remember uh, sitting right over there and talking to you there after we had the, the problem up north and saying, right. Mark, let's get it fixed. Make sure you tell us, uh, make sure you know what it is. Come back to us in a very short time, I think we said. What's it gonna take? We wanna get it fixed. Right. And we don't wanna have the same problem with water and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so we wanna make sure we have that fixed. My, one of my questions is, uh, you know, this, this, the storm uh, drainage, uh, wastewater drainage, or the storm sewers, um, why does that come out of, of uh, why not out of streets? It seems to me that you're, are you going in and changing and, and fixing those things before or after the streets have been, uh, been fixed, or are you doing it in conjunction most of the time with when the streets are being fixed? Most of the time it's in conjunction. But, um, you know, like we just drove this, the entire street system again to map potholes, frost boils, intakes, and low manhole covers. And so what we can then do is we'll, we'll put a cluster of those intakes together. And if they're in one of our reconstruction areas or our mill and overlay areas, we'll include it in those projects. If not, we'll just cluster those. We usually let about a $100,000 contract. That's kind of a nice 
size contract for most of our intake contractors. Um, and then we'll sometimes let up to say three of those a year. Um, and so it's a combination. Sometimes if they're scattered um, and we don't want those to wait, um, we'll just let, because they can do fairly small excavations, make it make a nice improvement and then move on. Okay. If I may continue, I have two more. Okay. Um, I looked at uh, slide number 39 there and I, uh, about the water purification project and the lead and all this kind of stuff. Is our water system in the same system as our sewer system was a few years ago? Um, no, I mean, I would tell you that our, uh, there's, there's a lot of impacts that can affect a water main. Some of it's age, um, and some of it's the quality of the soil that's around it. You know, we spent almost 10 years in the southwest part of Sioux Falls. Those water mains went in, and it's a very corrosive soil. And, but for, you know, wrapping those water mains, it just wasn't a practice back then. Those corrosive soils ate right through the water main. Now we've got some other water mains in town that are north of 100 years old that deliver clean, fresh water every day. <coughs> um, but what we've done is Greg and his team and the engineering team, last year we mapped every single segment. We wanted to have a good, ses good assessment of the age of every one of our water mains. And then we overlaid it where we've seen breaks in recent years. Nice. And then we established uh, an age of 90 years. <coughs> That's our goal, to have our distribution system 90 years or less. And so that's what we're working toward. I want to be a water main. I hope I make it to 90. <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> last, last one. That is, um, on a wastewater treatment facility, I see we're at about 2 thirds of capacity now. Uh, mm -hmm. With the growth that we have, uh, and we're projecting, uh, how soon before we're going to have to do something major out there? Well, a couple things. So we're already uh, underway with writing the next master plan. So we selected the consultant in uh, January. We did interviews last year. We selected the consultant. We're already uh, three months into that master plan study. And planning's in the room. Public Works is in the room, really trying to model. Uh, if we grow anywhere from, say, 350 to 600 acres a year based on the year. Um, you know, we have to model where we need our next sewers to meet that growth. All that wastewater has to go somewhere, um, whether it's to the current plant or a future plant, and so we're analyzing that. Um, but we also have uh, another factor in mind is that our, our treatment plant treats very good wastewater, and we think that there's an opportunity to get it re-rated just a little bit more with minimal capital investment. So there's a chance that we think that if we conduct a, uh, what we call a re-rate study, and we're kicking that off, that maybe we can take that 21 million gallons up to as high as maybe 27 million gallons mm. with strategic um, capital improvements. And so more to come on both of them, but we do have a national team that's helping us uh, work with planning and public works to really model out what this community is gonna look like in 25 years but also we've asked them to model out what it's gonna look like in 100 years, because we wanna identify where those big collection mains will be, whether we end up sewering all the way to Wall Lake, uh, whether we end up going further south, where that growth is gonna be, so we're having those conversations. Uh, and then ultimately, what a master plan does, it identifies those key projects in a priority basis, then we fold them into our model, and then we'll be right back here to talk to you about them. So, Thank you. Yep. For Kylie. Thank you. Uh, Mark, the City Council passed a resolution in 2009 that basically states that all um, enterprise accounts cover the true cost for the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how city as a whole and its residents have benefited since that time as a, due to this process that was passed in 2009? I mean, compared to what we were doing previously. I would think, I think the one thing it provides, Counselor, is just real certainty and direction, policy making as to how you manage these utilities. Um, it's been a practice for decades in Sioux Falls. I think Tracy had mentioned that they looked back to an audit report in 1976 and they were still, they were managed as enterprise funds uh, you know, almost 40 to uh, plus years ago. But it really, I think, codified in policy that says we've established, they, the council established reserve targets, balanced budget, 
for the general fund and and it also spoke to the enterprise funds you know i would hope that our customers if they see the presentation it gives them certainty on this the health of their systems where when they write their check for their water and wastewater bill um, that those dollars get reinvested back into the system and at any time they can come out and see them they are their utilities um, to uh, be more certain about it so it is it's uh, enabled the city to deliver a better product absolutely uh, they are they are standalone business units that have to live within their budget and also have to prioritize projects and then do stepped rate increases to meet those revenue needs. Okay. Yep. One, um, one other question, and then maybe a follow-up. Um, and this was on slide 46 regarding the wastewater treatment facility, design capacity average flow, um, and the 2015 average flow. 2015 average flow is almost three quarters, almost 75 percent right now. How? Uh, and then in uh, slide. Uh, 49 you address priority water reclamation projects do any of those address that flow capacity uh, and and at what point in time do we become concerned that we're nearing capacity so that's why we're already there writing the master plan because we've got to give you a long-term plan and how we meet the growth ultimately add more capacity so that master plan will have it'll look at every element of the treatment process everything from uh, grit removal to primary digesters secondary digesters trickling filters air future regulations i mean one of our one of our factors that we know is coming is uh, 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 increased standards and so we're we're faced with nutrient removal probably within the next 10 years. So in the model, we're planning for nutrient removal that removes uh, phosphorus and nitrate. That's almost a $60 million upgrade to take those two more constituents out. Um, and so you're gonna see investment into the plant. Um, you know, right here on this slide, you've got primary digester improvements. They are critical link in how we take the solids, stabilize them, and get them ready to be land applied. Uh, we're making a significant investment into there. Um, the dewatering and sludge dewatering, we're making a significant investment there to handle our solids much better. Um, and so, but this master plan will tell you that, and it'll tell us incrementally where we can add uh, improvements to increase capacity to meet the growth of this community. And these rate, rate in, proposed rate increases help to ensure that we are able to make these upgrades moving forward um, and to, to meet demand? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from council? Mark, I just, I think I have a couple here. Okay. Uh, in your presentation, you talked about uh, with the landfill. The DNR requires uh, the reserve, is that correct? Yeah, so there's two reserves in landfill. There's what we call an operational reserve. That's just so we can operate the utility, <laughs> um, basically run our checkbook. That's the nine, That's in landfill, it's a notch higher than 90 days. But it's got a second reserve, and it's called the restricted reserve. And that's a calculation we do with our consultant and the <laughs> DNR every year because we have to envision at some point in time we're going to close the landfill and right now our airspace is at 2076 and so that affects uh, when we're going to have to close the landfill but the the dnr has to ensure from an environmental standpoint that once the landfill is closed we have a cash account set aside so we can operate and maintain the landfill for another 30 years and so that's a permit requirement and that's why that gray um, that's why that's called restricted that is, we put dollars in that every year based on what we call uh, closure post closure <laughs> calculation. So, and then uh, if you could quickly just talk about the investments that we have done since, well, Councillor Jamison and I have been on since 2008. Yes, I'm going to bring you in this list, Councilman Jamison, and uh, we've done a huge investment in our wastewater, especially along the south end of the city, uh, through 
uh, all the way from Tud Hill into Yankton Trails. That's right. Could you speak to those type of investments and how it has affected and impacted our citizens? Right. So, um, again, right after the 2010 collapse, we, again, assessed every uh, major trunk line pipe. Um, because we know from an environment, our permit, we got to make sure we keep that wastewater in the pipe. Um, and we showed that the concrete pipe, that envelope on the top of the pipe, was basically deteriorating. And so those had to be replaced. I think we've spent, uh, and we can get this number for you, but we've spent north of $65 million, and we're not done yet. Um, you know, those were the Tier 1. Those were the top priority projects. Now we're in Tier 2. And that's why uh, Thursday, this week, uh, we're going to bid the 2-mile, 72-inch diameter outfall pipe and that's the backbone of the system. You know, if you look at a tree, that's the trunk of the tree. We've been working on the trunk of the tree for a number of years, but every project makes this utility stronger. Uh, it's been tens of millions of dollars again, and we're not done yet. And I also remember before being on the council when we did have some flooding issues down in the central area, I would say around... Uh, between 33rd and 41st Street in the Augustana area. Mm -hmm. And when we did some research on the pipes down there, uh, some of the things that we found inside our wastewater pipes were quite scary. Uh, gas lines, uh, cable right. lines, things people were actually drilling through our pipes. And today, I don't believe we have that anymore. No. Nope. And we also, uh, did we also not increase the inspection of our existing pipes? Because before that, we only inspected new pipes. And I believe that we've added that also to that. So You're right. the safety of our citizens has been uh, very important in the planning for uh, wastewater, water, and our infrastructure. You're exactly right. Yes. Mr. Chair? Sir, I would be remiss if I didn't at least comment on the nice charts <laughs> and that we were cauterized a few times today. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Y'all come back now. Yeah. What kind of morons run this outfit? <laughs>